Since it seems that not many people, some people are unwell for today, including me. Last week, my left ear had <coughs> swallowed. <coughs> now it's not that good. So when I, every time I speak, I hear my voice inside. <laughs> I came to the doctor several times, but it's not been uh, in good progress. You have to come to me during the break time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but for, for today, my voice is uh, it's not well heard to you. You can raise your voice, you can raise your hands so that I, to indicate me that you know you cannot hear well me. Anyway, so here is a quiz. Okay, shall we go over the quiz together? Mm -hmm. Anyone, any, any one of you volunteer finding for the correct answer for the number one? Sanyong? Sanyong? <coughs> number one? Read the question and then the response options, and then you pick up the uh, right one. I read all the options. Yes. Okay. Um, which statement is incorrect for environmental risks? There are many different lists of environmental risks that include landslides, earthquakes, and typhoons, etc. Environmental risks are <coughs> risks whose negative effects cannot be observed with naked eyes. There can be environmental risks that, that are unforeseeable because the risks cannot be captured due to the lack of relevant technological basis. Unacknowledged risk refers to the risk that is dismissed even though there is a signal sign that advances prior to reveal to real events of disaster. Unperceived risk refers to the risk that is not perceived in advance even though the risk is possible considering such situations as people living along the coastal lines, mountain areas, etc. Mm -hmm. So the correct answer is number two. Mm -hmm. So the incorrect um, option among these are number two. Mm -hmm. Because? Um, environmental risks are material risks. Mm -hmm. That are observed whose negative effects can be observed with the naked eyes, right? It's not an abstract one, it's the material one. Okay, Hobin, can you do the for the number two? Question two? Which statement is incorrect for Rick Society? Number one, Rick Society thesis is proposed by German sociologist Ole Beck. Number two, according to Rick Society thesis, women in society faces dealing with manufacturer risk. Number three, Manufacturers is different from the actuaries in, in that the former is created by technological innovation. Number four, manufacturers is a new risk in that it is not experienced prior to modern society. Number five, since only that does not come from the environmental sociology background, rich society thesis was not able to receive good reputation among environmental sociologists when it was proposed. <coughs> And I think the answer is number five. Number five, right? When it was proposed in 1992, even though Uli Beck was not an environmental sociologist, in his, uh, in his expertise, risk society received alarmingly uh, great uh, attention, great reputations. So the reason he became uh, rising up as a big star in sociology, sociological theory from the 1970s and his career as a, um, a theorist, social, sociological theorist has come along for the almost 30 years, but then all of a sudden um, finished with the unexpected death in some years back. So risk society thesis is one of the very influential sociological theory to explain social structure and social change. And the reason why he uh, his uh, risk society thesis has been very influential, has uh, received uh, 
uh, great uh, reputations among not only environmental sociologists but other uh, sociologists because it uh, considered the natural environment to explain uh, human so social structure and social change. And for the question three, um, Sewon Jr., can you do the question three? Number four, right? So, you know, what is that called? Those people living in non-affected areas. What are they called? Audiences, Audiences right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for question, question four, uh, Tanya, can you do that for us? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Which statement is incorrect for the work of? Schools, hospitals, and transportation stop to function. Two, the ice storming event indicates that modern society that is dependent upon technology based <coughs> infrastructure is vulnerable well to natural disaster. Three, during the event, the Amish people was least affected and they were able to maintain their everyday life. Four, for the ice storming case, Murphy concluded that more effective technological development is needed to handle with environmental risks such as the ice storming. The correct answer is four. Number four, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> but Murphy didn't conclude in this way. He's rather, uh, he's rather avoid uh, the further technological development in handling natural disasters, but he concluded that uh, it's, a, it's a reflexive way. He concluded in a reflexive way that how vulnerable modern society uh, is to natural disasters because modern society is based upon technological infrastructure. infrastructure. So his conclusion is more, uh, more indicative of reflexive modernity rather than for further uh, um, technological de development. And for number five, it has some typos, particularly for the, uh, the response type, uh, the option number one. So I will do this one myself, okay. Which statement is incorrect for the idea of reflexive modernity? Number one, the idea of reflexive modernity indicates that scientists and technology experts should be aware of what they are doing because they are the key players that influence the directions of modern society to go. And number two, the role of scientists. Am I heard well? Okay. The role of scientists is important in modern society because the prime mo mover of modern society is technology development and they are the very uh, producers of knowledge for technology development. Number three, due to the significant importance of scientists and technological experts, their practice should be based upon democracy principle and open to the public. Number four, since scientific uh, practices are well supervised by government, public should not worry about possible risks drawn from uh, scientific expert um, uh, practices. So the right answer is uh, number four, and which is an incorrect uh, statement for uh, reflexive modernity. 
So basically, the right uh, risk society, it's, it, it is the idea of a risk society thesis. So Ulibeck has uh, concerned about the possible um, the possible uh, the mal outcomes that come from technological development, possibly in terms of risk, so that you know the those people, scientific experts who produce knowledge for technological development, they should be aware of what they are doing, and also their practice should be open to the public and you know based on democratic uh, principle. That's the way of reducing possible disasters that are drawn from uh, technological development. And question six, Hyunji, can you do that? No, no, the way we do, you know, you read the question and the options. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Compared to uh, scientific expertise knowledge, LEK uh, civic science based uh, knowledge is not well received. Particularly, uh, the scientists they do not they have a kind of tendency not to be willing to um, include the knowledge coming from LEK. LEK. So somehow, it's a kind of a it's a kind of a movement, it's a kind of a civic movement among lay people, you know, to, to produce knowledge for, for sci scientific uh, knowledge. So it's a kind of social mov movement against the, the dictatorship of scientific expertise. So scientists, natural scientists, they do not, do not, uh, the much uh, willing will to uh, accept those uh, knowledge coming from um, civic science, civic scientists, which are uh, lay people. Okay, uh, question seven, Sun Sao. I was meant to write down mountains because the typos with the rivers two times. Sorry about that, you know. Resilient. Resilient. Uh huh. Answer <coughs> is great. Mm -hmm. Number five, right? Mm -hmm. 
I said uh, mega cities, for mega cities, planning of uh, risk management plans is quite difficult. And I mentioned several, uh, several things why it's difficult to um, set up a systematic risk management plans. Okay. Easy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the the topic for today is is environmental justice and inequality. <laughs> but before uh, doing the the topic for today, I just want to show the one photo which I have aimed to show you many weeks before. Have you seen this photo? Yes? Yes? One sec. Have you seen this photo before? Where? Okay, yes, yes. I also picked up from the Hungary, the online news portal, you know. And where is it? Where does that show? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Gangnam Akkujeong area in 1978. So it's just 30 years back, right? So in Seoul, there was also cow, and they plowed the field, and there was a farmer like that. But if you visit Gangnam, this is Akkujeong, which is among the uh, richest residence area in South Korea, not only so in total whole of the South Korea, Apgujongdong. How many people live in Apgujongdong? Any person, anybody in this class live Apgujongdong? Okay, I will check later. Uh, it's among among Gangnam Gu area, Apgujongdong. You know, it's the very among ri richest residence place in in South Korea. But the just 30 years back, there was cow, you know, and there was an agricultural field. But so this photo to me is a very um, symbolic and very uh, snapshot that shows us how rapidly the economic development, tr economic transformation from agriculture based to industry based to manufacturing industry based uh, taken place in South Korea for the past 30 years. Right. So you see, this is a Hyundai Apart. And Hyundai Apart is also among the uh, very famous uh, the apartment brand. If you live in uh, so if you live in South Korea in an apartment, particularly with the names, with the brand logos. That indicates you are, you are from wealthy family, you know. Hyundai Apart is one of them, and it's con constructed by Hyundai, Hyundai company, Hyundai uh, Jebol, Hyundai con Constructions. So the construction is uh, uh, has been uh, was being done just <laughs> in front of the car. The <laughs> The agriculture field is uh, plowed by with a fellow fellow uh, farmer. For me, it's a very um, I mean, brought me think of a lot of things. What about you? Is that is that a shock for you, or just uh, being ve very familiar? What kind of impression when you look at this photo, uh, Hyuna? Sorry? Ironic. Ironic, ironic, right? Mm -hmm. Can you explain us some a little bit more? Um, at the back side of the photo there, and the field are not. There are apartments, and the which are really modern and um, well developed. And the front side of the photo includes, um, um, like agriculture moments, like not really well developed. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great contrast, right? Great contrast. So it's the kind of beginning of modern life in South Korea, you know, getting away of um, traditional lifestyle. 
so farmers becomes uh, the factory workers, um, and I consider when it's all done, they they were they were taken away, taken away, moved they are, they are re removed from the scene, <coughs> because now many when the this kind of new development begins, the scenery, the controlling the sceneries is new and urban and fancy is also important. So those people who live this kind of you know way, they they are uh, forced to, to be taken away. Sewon, mm -hmm. um, senior, does that say anything to you? Sure, sure. Really mm -hmm. So it's a very fast development, right? Very fast social change. Um, so it's, a, it's a kind of traditional way, and it's a very modern way. And there were one time it uh, coexisted, co and probably in the mid 80s, particularly, particularly before the Olympic, 88 Olympic. Probably, you know, the the great great transformation to to modern way of living styles are adopted. Okay. Uh, Killa, you can have find this kind of thing also in Australia, Australian development. Mm. Well, I'm not too sure because I'm looking at like the city area, so I don't really see a lot of it. But we do still have all the like, I guess, agricultural stuff out west or something. Not much. Well, you don't really get to see it because it's not near the cities. Mm -hmm. You have to sort of go out like west to see that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Somehow the, the land use is somehow, um, very clearly demarcated, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than, you know, one space has a very two different, you know, Sure, okay. Mm -hmm. So it also, you know, I, I have from the beginning, uh, I have mentioned several times the society change, like from hunting, cult, hunting gathering, <coughs> and pastoral society, and agricultural society, and industrial, you know, and post industrial. So that includes many things, I mean, individually, that also indicates how we organize everyday life and how we maintain our uh, life course and so on. So also you have to think about the kind of so society change, how it relates to environmental change, right? And uh, and the topic for today is tell us that how environmental change can relate to uh, social inequality so the topic for today is environmental justice and social inequality. Okay, I'll mention first uh, the unequal world and negative environmental change. And then I mention, I'll introduce two concepts. One is environmental justice and the other is climate justice, right? So the <coughs> knowing the, these two concepts are very important, environmental justice and climate justice. And then I conclude the topic for today. So sociology is uh, very well has established research tradition for studying social inequality. And some people consider sociologists are radical, but which is not true. I mean, <laughs> some, some people outside of a sociology uh, background, they consider sociology is somehow radical discipline because sociology 
uh, is very traditional uh, research tradition for studying social inequality. Uh, compared to other, like uh, compared to economics and politics and so, uh, so on and so on, I think sociology is the most strong research tradition for uh, studying social inequality. And social inequality is defined as unequal distribution of wealth and life chances and social recognition and honors and health and some other uh, dimensions also <coughs> among people in a society. So which means some people compared to other people enjoy more wealth and life chances and recognitions and honor. They receive more honors and they enjoy a uh, better quality of health. And at the same time it means some people suffer less wealth and less life chances and less uh, but uh, not good health and not enough uh, honors and not recognized well. So the topic for today, in what way social inequality leads to environmental change? So I, I mentioned that sociology has a well research tradition for studying sociology. And if you understand the beginning of sociology, you, have, you can understand well, because sociology, when it was founded in the, late, in the 19th century in Europe, Western Europe, uh, those sociologists, like uh, those people, those scholars, uh, founding father of uh, sorry, founding father of sociology, like uh, Emil Durkheim, Karl Marx, and Max Weber, they, they are all wanted to understand the great uh, social transformation of the Industrial Revolution and uh, French Revolution, which in what way impact upon um, different social groups. So by Industrial Revolution, they uh, emerged industrialization and ur urbanization. So those people who used to live in uh, village, agricultural village, with the industrial revolution, they became a uh, factory worker living in an urban area. So this is a, it's a big social change. And then the sociologists, they want to know this big change uh, impact upon different groups in what ways? Whether it has some different unequal distribution, that whether causes some unequal distribution of wealth and wealth and uh, health and life chances and so social recognitions and so on uh, for different groups of people. And among the important sociology concepts, social class and social stratification, they are the old concepts to explain uh, social inequality among people in a society. So uh, now I would, I would say, the, as an environmental sociological topic, the linkages between uh, negative environmental change and social inequality. So from the 1970s, environmental issues emerged as an important social is issue, particularly in the Western Europe and in the United States. And from the 90s, it has spread all over the world. And there were concerns about the condition of natural environment. Many people pointed out that a natural environment has been becoming unhealthy, has been there has been negative change observed in natural environment. And there came uh, questions, if uh, natural environment has degraded, if nature, the condition of natural environment has been not that good, not healthy, or does that uh, impact upon uh, social groups? Does that impact upon people? And if so, in what way? And particularly, do the negative environmental change affect social groups uh, disproportionately? So for some people are uh, more likely to be affected 
with negative environment change uh, or not. So I mentioned several times you can think about natural environment in three different ways natural resources and environmental quality and ecosystem. So if you consider environmental change, negative environmental change, uh, that, that indicates the natural res resources, one time there were large amount, enough, enough. Even if you spend the water, you know, a lot, a lot, there's still a lot left, so you don't have to worry. But if you consider negative environmental change in natural resources, the large amount becomes smaller. So now people think about sh the water is becoming shorter, running out of short. It's becoming short and run, 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 run out. So that's the uh, depletion problem. The large amount becomes shrink to smaller uh, amount. So if one day there's uh, no amount of natural resources, uh, those all the industries, industries based upon certain uh, natural resources, they have to go. The smaller amount, it, um, the one day if the, there's no amount, and the industry based upon that particular natural resource, they have to go. And for environmental quality, uh, for imbar negative environmental change indicates one time it, it is very clean. <coughs> Everywhere it's very clean, but not in means dirty. So the quality is deteriorated. And ecosystem, one time it was very healthy, well connected among members in natural world. They have they were able to maintain good relationships, which have thousand thousand, you know, established as that way they you know um, function healthy and, and stable. Ah, uh, sorry, that's the typo. Healthy and stable, but not, now they are unhealthy and destructed. Destruction. So these are the thing when you think about specifically environmental problems, you can mention three things in a specific term. So the natural resources becoming smaller, smaller, and then the environmental quality is becoming dirty, dirtier, and ecosystems is becoming unstable, unhealthy. So kind of a new mutants, new patterns of interactions among members in natural world uh, found uh, compared to the one that we observed for many years. So does this all uh, change, negative change, would um, cause social inequality? So I define the social inequality unequal distribution of wealth and health and life chances, recognition, honor and extra among people uh, in a society. So these uh, negative cha environmental change patterns would cause social inequality uh, among people in a, in, a, in a society. That's the key question. Uh, for environmental sociologists who wanted to address these relationships, this relationship where the negative environmental change affect uh, people uh, living, pe people uh, differently, disproportionately. Okay, so that's the, that's the one I mentioned already in a, in a figure, in a diagram. So if the negative environmental change affect um, people in a society differently, and who are likely to suffer, suffer more the negative environmental change? Uh, that, that's the question. That's the question for, uh, for, for environmental sociologists who want to address environmental justice issue. And these are the two concepts, 
environmental justice and climate justice for environmental sociologists who are interested in uh, understanding the linkages between negative environmental change and new dimensions of social inequality in, um, in the 21st century. So environmental justice and climate justice, okay? So those uh, environmental sociologists who argue for environmental justice, which means uh, some environmental sociologists believe that the negative environmental change uh, cause uh, social inequality among people in a society. So which means some, some people, some, some segments of people are more likely to be affected by negative environmental change are more than, 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 counterpart, than their counterparts. And they refute the, um, the risk suicide thesis, which we just learned last week. Uh, the Uli Beck's risk society thesis. Risk, Uli Beck, one time he named that hunger is unequal, but smog is equal. You know, that's one of the famous uh, phrase of risk society thesis. <coughs> so that phrase also kind of indicate that sociologists should be somehow going away from studying social inequality issue because, but, but environmental justice uh, sociologists, uh, environmental justice sociologists, they refute this argument and they saying that uh, negative environmental, the Uli Beck, they said, Uli Beck, he said the negative environmental change affects everybody, affects everybody. So this uh, slogan, this metaphor indicates that negative environmental change affects uh, everybody. But scholars of environmental justice refute uh, the argument and they want to uh, maintain the tradition of studying social inequality in environmental sociology. And they say some, some group of people are more vulnerable some group of people are more vulnerable to negative environmental change, whether it's for income, whether it's for health, whether it's for uh, life chances, whether it's for social recognition and honor. Um, some group of people compared to others are more likely to be victims of negative environmental change. So it's the reputations against um, the Ruli Beck's risk society thesis that he said the environmental risk is equal to everybody, you know, smoke is it, um, equal to everybody. But uh, environmental justice, so, um, those environmental sociologists who want to study environmental justice issue, they push um, more social inequality issue in relation to uh, negative environment change. So negative environment change, uh, according to environmental justice uh, scholars, negative environmental change disproportionately impacts <coughs> certain social groups. So certain social groups in a society are li likely to be victims of negative environmental change are likely to be uh, environmental victims, which means uh, some people are likely to be victims of negative environmental change, whether there's um, a lot, the, particularly the quality, air quality or water quality, when it's becoming dirty, some, some group of people are likely to be more affected negatively, so it means they become uh, environmental uh, victims. And disproportionate means that having or showing a difference that is not fair, reasonable, or expect, not fair and not reasonable and, or not expected, is somehow too large and too small in relation to something. That's the meaning of uh, disproportionate. So whether the impact of negative environmental change would be disproportionate to, to some group or not, that's the key question for um, 
environmental sociologists who want to, to link the environmental change and social inequality issue. So justice means the fair treatment of people of all races and cultures and incomes and education levels. So just in a word, wh whoever, you, wh whoever you are, whether you are rich or whether you are a um, Spanish-speaking person or whether you are poor or a uh, white person or high, highly educated or not, regardless of those kind of condition. Uh, with respect to the development and enforcement environmental laws, regulations <coughs> and policies, everybody, everybody should be treated fairly. Everybody uh, should be uh, treated fairly, fairly. And that's the uh, definition of Environmental Protection Agency of the United States. So injustice means disproportion. So the impact of environmental change is not equal. It's not equal to. It's not equal to everybody. Some people are more receive more more harm, more hazardous. Uh, so that's the injustice, uh, according to Environmental Protection Protection Agency of United States. So. Environmental justice is the com combination of social justice with the environmental pro uh, problems. And the and environmental justice idea emphasized that the socioeconomically disadvantaged groups, which means that poor people, they are affected more harms and risk than their counterparts, than, uh, than rich people, socioeconomically um, the better, better off uh, groups by hazardous facilities and effects. The hazardous facilities in this case means like a waste, um, waste treatment uh, facilities, like a burning, you know, if when there's the waste collected, they go to uh, waste treatment facilities and you burn, you burn them. So certain wastes are very dangerous, and they're called ha hazardous, ha hazardous waste. So environmental justice scholars found out those dangerous facilities are located in uh, dis uh, disproportionately at socioeconomically um, deprived groups, socioeconomically disadvantaged groups. And that's not in just that's not fair, which is not fair, you know. So disproportionate uh, effect upon uh, different groups. So some people receive more uh, negative impact of uh, environmental change. So <coughs> now it has uh, now it has uh, extended uh, the many categories of environmental change. So the, whether the change in air, whether the change in w water, and differentiated exposed to the like like ability of disasters. Uh, for example, in mega cities, whether those people along the rivers and mountains, which are considered um, somehow uh, possible risks, whether those areas, people leaving those areas are uh, whether social economically um, disadvantaged groups. So some rich people, they leave distance, somehow make a distance, but that that's the issue of uh, environmental justice. For example, the when the tsunami attacked in Japan, tsunami in 2011, those people who just washed off, who are living along the the sea, living along the sea like Fukushima, yeah. 
we one time the a group of uh, East Asian environmental socialist groups when we had a conference in two years back we visited the Fukushima disaster area and particularly the village you know the most of the people were just are uh, dead so the Japanese professor explained that those who are uh, who who died with their case they are the ones who lived along the mountains near the mountain and near the seas they are the very person no nobody no, nobody nobody survived who lived near the sea and who lived the mountain they are the very first groups who are, who are attacked by the natural disaster of tsunami so we can ask we can ask whether in terms of residence <coughs> uh, locations, <coughs> whether there's a possible risk, those economically, socioeconomically advantaged groups, they are more likely to live in those areas. And whether real risk happen, whether it also has some linkages with the socioeconomic status. So if, if you are poor, if you are poor, you are more likely to be affected when real disaster happens. And so you can, you can research, you can uh, survey, think about the real disaster uh, that happened in South Korea or in Japan or in China, whatever, in your country, in, in, in the United States. You can research who are those who actually died uh, after the during the uh, the real real events of natural disaster, whether they are social economically deprived or not, you can you can study, you can research, <coughs> and then uh, sometimes uh, social economically disadvantaged groups uh, they can be located near to unwanted uh, the facilities. And in relation to environmental problems, those dangerous, like uh, uh, the waste facilities, whether they are located to, to those places or not. That's the key issue for uh, environmental justice uh, research. So environmental justice begins in the United States in the 80s and I, I, at that time when environmental justice issue first raised it is termed as environmental racism rather than environmental justice because the no I mentioned this no, sorry I mentioned this first the robot blood is the professor based in Texas and he's the father of environmental justice. So he's the very first scholar who raised out, who raised out this uh, social inequality issue in relation to uh, negative environmental change. And when he uh, addressed this issue, he said that black people compared to white and are more likely to, su to suffer, to suffer the hazardous, environmental hazardous mm. uh, that come from um, incinerating, incinerator uh, hazardous waste. So dangerous waste like uh, chemical things, chemical waste. So when the so waste are very different types, we will learn after the Exam. The in May we will learn about the waste issue. So there are many different types of waste, and when they burn, some waste are okay, but some waste are very dangerous. If you smell, you you probably uh, very stuff for your health health condition. So, but then the robot blood and his colleagues found out. Uh, black people compared to white people um, are located 
uh, disproportionately located, located disproportionately to these uh, hazardous, dangerous waste facilities. Which means, when, which means in everyday life, they are likely to uh, receive some very uh, chemical comp compounds when they breathe, and that all affects negatively up, uh, upon their health. So it's, uh, they termed it environmental racism because uh, compared to uh, white, black people, it's the one uh, suffer most with these un unwanted uh, dangerous uh, the waste incinerate facilities. So it's a great contrast between white residentship, white residents, and black residents. It's a great contrast that a lot more, a lot disproportionate number of waste uh, incinerate facilities are located to black communities, so it's uh, environmental racism, is, it's a racist issue. So when environmental justice was first raised in the 80s, it is called environmental racism. So there's a book um, that addressed toxic waste and race in the US. And there was also a report uh, published in 1987. That's the very first formal record, formal document that showed uh, with strong evidence, with strong evidence that shows uh, spatial, geographical spatial distribution of uh, hazardous uh, chemical waste incinerators in the US, where they are, where they are located. So in this report, there's a very strong evidence, there very strong empirical evidence. And then the, including Robert Blood and his colleagues, they argued for it is a racist issue in the United States. And it is the uh, racist issue is manifest with a negative environmental change. Uh, in, in this case, environmental thing that the regarding uh, waste, regarding waste. So white people enjoy environmental goods, they consume a lot, you know, but then when they, those uh, goods becoming waste, those all the negative things, uh, the blacks, they have to suffer the, all the negative things coming from environmental ba bears. They are, not they are not much able to enjoy environmental goods, but then they have to they are exposed to suffer environmental bears, in this case, being located to uh, hazardous waste incinerator uh, facilities. So it's a very strong report, and many people were surprised. So they put the, the map of the United States, they put the web of the United States, and they showed a very strong uh, correlation with the uh, areas uh, that are mainly populated, man, mainly lived by black people or immigrants, you know, Hispanic, Asian immigrants, and the number of West incinerated facilities, where they are. So they find a very strong correlation. And then they conclude that it is, it is, an it is environmental racism that black communities suffer most Incredibly, inc incredibly. So that's the very first uh, formal, formal document that push up the social in inequality in relation to natural environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a very strong, uh, strong report. <coughs> so many people are shocked. Many people are. People just talking, oh, maybe, but then it is documented and surveyed and evidenced with a very strong um, the map information like this. And that's the, that's the, founding, that's the findings uh, indicated in the report, toxic waste and races in US. So, and it, it is the very beginning that environmental justice is issue 
uh, spreading out in the United States as a social movement issue. So in the report, it says three out of five black Americans live in communities with uncontrolled toxic waste sites. So uncontrolled means that unmanaged and unsupervised. So it's a, it's a double, triple uh, risk. Toxic waste site itself is uh, dangerous because as I mentioned, when the waste burns up, it creates some compounds, the chemical compounds on the air. But the way the toxic waste is burned is not controlled and is not managed, is not supervised. That indicates that implies more risks. So three out of five, so about 70% of black people, they are exposed to very dangerous chemical compounds that coming out of uh, uncontrolled toxic waste sites. And blacks heavily overrepresented in those metropolitan areas with the greatest number of such sites. <coughs> So which means that where the greatest number of toxic waste sites, there are black people living there. So it's a very strong con uh, correlation, very strong correlation. What about in Seoul? Where are uh, toxic waste sites? There probably are. The chemical, uh, the facilities, and you can survey whether people, who people live in uh, those areas, they have they have a specific uh, profiles profiles of social economic or social demographic and so on so on. So uh, these are the areas with the black people overrepresented in terms of living near near to a uh, toxic waste site. So Texas, Houston in Texas and Memphis, uh, Tennis, and Missouri, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and Ohio, Cleveland, and Illin uh, Chicago, and Illinois. These are the, uh, these are the, uh, the, the areas, the places uh, that black people are overrepresented <coughs> in terms of in terms of leaving their residential ship near to the toxic waste sites. And also Hispanics and Asian Americans and native peoples, they are also overrepresented, leaving near to uh, the toxic waste sites, which have which has implication that they are likely to suffer more that they are likely to suffer more, particularly for their health, for, for their health in their everyday life, uh, they are likely to suffer more with the uh, uh, bad effects of uh, burning toxic waste from toxic waste sites. That's the very strong, um, we call it strong evidence, and many people are shocked. And so they showed that this whole map and Professor Blood, he has a lot of the spatial data. So for the past 30 years, he, he, he has uh, researched environmental uh, justice issue, and he showed uh, very, a lot of different sets of uh, <coughs> spatial, this is called spatial uh, distribution data, whether there's a strong correlation between waste and toxic waste sites. Yeah, so that's the beginning of environmental justice research in the, in the 80s. Okay, let's have a break for 15 minutes. The report published in 1987 was the very <coughs> first uh, formal record documentation that shows the, the spatial distribution of uh, very <coughs> dangerous chemical waste incinerators and that has a very strong correlation with the black people's uh, community <coughs> location. So these five region, these five regions topped out, popped out as the major uh, the areas we can talk about the links between environment, um, 
the West incinerators, the, lo the location, the overrepresentation of the West inc uh, uh, incinerators near to black communities. So Texas, the Houston in Texas, <coughs> and Tennis, <coughs> Memphis in ten uh, Tennis, and St. Louis in Missouri, and Chicago in Illinois, and uh, Cleveland in Ohio. These are the five metropolitan areas uh, that can argue for, they show the very strong uh, correlations, very strong links of black communities' location and to uh, toxic waste incinerators. So Robert Blood, he's the big name in environmental justice research. Whatever uh, research done under the name of environmental justice, his name is uh, well recognized. So he's among the person who authored the report, 1987 report. And he's the very person who formally uh, pro <coughs> problematized, problematized in the name of environmental waste, so uh, the bad health effects of black people receive more because uh, by by being located near to dangerous waste incinerators, black people are more likely to suffer uh, health <coughs> problems. And this book is a kind of uh, classic in environmental justice research and dumping in Dixie. Dixie, is the, there's a meaning, right, Lina? What does that mean in American colloquial? You don't know? <coughs> really? OK. Dixie indicates those areas I just uh, pointed out. But in South area, South areas, so dumping in DC. So the you dump uh, uh, waste, particularly dangerous one, in those uh, specific areas. The subtitle is a race, class, and environmental quality. And they formed a strong environmental justice movement, which uh, which was headed by a uh, robot blood. And the voice became very strong and very opinionated in the public. And uh, the, the, what's his name? Uh, Clinton. Clinton administration, when they began their uh, presidentialship in the early 1990s, he invited the road to blood as an uh, uh, advisory, policy advisory is an advisory for environmental policy making. Uh, that means his report was uh, very strong enough to evocate the people st for standing up uh, saying uh, against the, the racist issue. Probably without this report, people, uh, black people, even if black people are suffering their health problem, <coughs> They probably do not much uh, in, uh, evidence to show, <coughs> but anyway, uh, they did uh, very uh, great work, and then it becomes uh, one of the uh, Clinton's uh, Clint Clinton administrative um, policy issues. So, what blood? Uh, Professor Blood asked for uh, minorities the basic right. The basic right, one of the basic right is uh, to live in a health, in health, to live a healthy life. Whether you are black, whether you are man, or woman, whether you are rich or not, all the the people have a basic right, and one of them is a uh, living healthy. <coughs> so he ignited the social inequalities issue, and he ignited the racism issue, <coughs> which was a very strong uh, movement in the 70s, the, the, and also the <coughs> giving uh, rights, social rights for minorities, including blacks, that was the very uh, key, a very strong uh, 
movement motto for social movement in the 60s and 70s. So he, he bound up again the issue in relation to uh, environmental issues. So in, in terms of environmental quality, everybody should be equal to enjoy the clean, um, clean envir environmental quality, clean air quality. Whether you are rich or the way that you are um, not rich, black, woman, or whether we are, it doesn't matter. Everybody, everybody should be have should have the right to enjoy a uh, good air quality. But they found out blacks are significantly uh, not not able not able to enjoy good quality because they their their residents. Their residents, their communities are located near to dangerous waste incinerators. And then, so their everyday life in terms of enjoying uh, good air quality has been uh, threatened. So there are three uh, dimensions of environmental equity. One is uh, procedure equity. So. Uh, whatever rules and regulations, evaluation, they should apply to equally to everybody. So, whether you are blacks or whites, and you know whether you are whatever your category of uh, of so in society, they should be, should be applied uniformly, equally. That is called procedural equal equality. So it's against uh, that. Why black communities? Why the black communities end up uh, nearing to uh, dangerous waste incinerators? Which means the procedure equality was not guaranteed for them. So regulations and rules are not equally applied to them. That's that's why they ended up being located to to, to dangerous. Uh, the waste incinerators. And, and another reason, blacks compared to whites are less powerful in American society. So probably, you know, uh, white people, they have more uh, negotiation with the, with the politicians and so on. Not, not, not having, not hosting those um, unwanted, dangerous, uh, facilities to be located uh, with uh, around the, their uh, residential places. So that means uh, procedural equality was not guaranteed for uh, for blacks and non-blacks equally. And the second is a geographic equality. Whether you live rich neighborhood, uh, poor neighborhood. There should be equality in terms of the location of uh, hazardous waste uh, facilities. Whether, whether you live should not make any difference <coughs> to, to, to living near to um, dangerous waste facilities or not. So for example, if uh, equality matters and if equality guaranteed, there should be equal numbers, equal numbers to white uh, communities and not white communities. And there should be equal numbers, uh, minority uh, groups and non-minority groups. And there should be equal numbers of um, socioeconomically disadvantaged groups and not advantaged groups. That means geographic equity in, uh, in environmental issues. And then third is a social equality. Social equity, so race and class and other cultural factors <coughs> also must be recognized in environmental decision making. So these are the things that uh, uh, environmental change, <coughs> the air quality becomes dirty with the, um, with the host, with the location of with the location of waste incinerators. Everybody should be equal uh, receiving the negative impact rather than certain group of people, certain segment of uh, people are more vulnerable to receive negative impact <coughs> of uh, the air quality becoming dirty. 
Does that make sense? <coughs> Does that make sense? Sonia? Ah, what I'm saying that uh, in this case, the air quality has become dirty, right? With the, uh, with the location of uh, waste <coughs> incinerators, waste incinerators. If the waste burns, they emit a dangerous pollutant. They emit not good pollutants when waste burns. And that uh, somehow deteriorate the quality of air. So if that negative change happen, that that impacts everybody equally. Whether you are rich, whether you are not rich, whether you are man or woman, whatever you are, <coughs> the negative change affect uh, everybody equally not disproportionately to certain groups. <coughs> so according to environmental justice research, it's not a, it's not a, it's not an, it's not fair. It's not a fair treatment. <coughs> it's not fair and it should not be that way. Right? <coughs> but their report found out very strong evidence that those areas called the Dixie, the Texas, so east to south, east to south, those areas, uh, the metropolitan, that means the capital city of the rich e region, <coughs> like Illinois, the state, the capital, the state capital, it's the called metropolitan areas. Those black communities have a strong correlations with the location of waste incinerators, that means in the United States, the negative impact of environmental change, particularly with the case of uh, location, uh, with the case of location of waste incinerators, the burning the waste, deteriorating environmental quality, that gives a uh, negative impact disproportionately to whom? To blacks. Right? Yeah, to blacks. <coughs> this pro pro not equally uh, to, to everybody, but uh, disproportionately to blacks, the, the negative, uh, the air quality change uh, gives all, almost the, all the negative impact all goes to uh, black people. And also immigrants and aborigines are the, the original people. Uh, American Indians, they, their communities also found out with the uh, location of, with the over-representation in number of <coughs> waste incinerators. <coughs> and these are the major components of environmental justice frame. So if you do, if you doing environmental justice, what does that mean? you have the right to obtain information. So if you are treated fairly, if you are treated equally to <coughs> other people in environmental issues, in Im negative environmental change, what does that mean? You, ha you have the right to obtain information about your situation. So for example, if some, uh, some facilities that might affect air quality or water quality, or whatever natural environment negatively, you have the right to obtain. If the kind of facilities are located to be, are, are in the future, are to be <coughs> located around your, your communities, you have the right to obtain information. Right? And also you have the right to, uh, to a serious hearing, to attend the hearing, and then from, from that place, you can discuss or you can hear the information, you know. <coughs> when contamination, contamination claims are raised, and you have the right to compensation from those who have polluted a particular neighborhood. So for example, 
in your neighborhood, there's a, a pulp, pulp, pulp factory. What does that mean, pulp, pulp factory? The, the factory that creates pulp, who <coughs> makes uh, papers and so on, so on. You, they, they need a lot of chemicals to, to make the pulps from trees to pulps. So think about around your neighborhoods, there's a plan. There's a plan that the pulp uh, factory to be located, but you don't know. Your f parents don't know, nobody knows in your community. But one day, uh, some, some people ha have a cancer and some people died and so on and so on. And then you, uh, your community members come to know that it's a link, it's a relationship, correlations between the, the pulp, pulp company, pulp uh, factories and the deaths. And in, in that case, it, if that thing is uh, evidenced, and if that thing is uh, proved valid and true, you, ha you have the right to, to have a compensation, to, to receive money, receive money for, for your loss. And you have the right of democratic participation in deciding the future of the contaminated community. So if your uh, community is contaminated with uh, some dangerous <coughs> facilities environmentally, so those facilities are located, your neighborhood uh, ecosystem will be contaminated. So you have the right to <coughs> attend some meetings and you bring out your voices because that all uh, affect your life, your ev everyday life. So you attend the meetings and you voice out and that's the uh, uh, influence, that's the influence that your community's futures and including your own, uh, including your uh, future. And there's another case you can uh, mention environmental justice, vulnerability, vulnerability to disasters. So in 2005, there's a very uh, strong hurricane. Katrina attacked the <coughs> north and southeast of uh, United States. And uh, 1,833 people died, and among them, the black communities stood out, overrepresented uh, among the mortality, <coughs> among those uh, people who died. The, the black communities stood up, the overrepresented <coughs> among the people who died. So at that time, it was also uh, discussed in terms of environmental racism issue compared to non-black, compared to white people, black people are more vulnerable to certain uh, natural disasters. In this case, it's a hurricane, typhoon, hurricane, typhoon. <coughs> now I mention another uh, environmental justice issue in relation to health. And this comes from New Zealand. New Zealand. Anybody, anybody have have uh, visited uh, New Zealand? Ah, Sonia, can you tell us your experience traveling mm -hmm. New Zealand? Uh, I lived in Christchurch. Uh huh. You went to Christchurch. No, ah, because. Now I know why your English is so good. Mm -hmm. And then? Yes, yeah, so I went to her and I studied for um, <coughs> a year for like, English learning purposes. So how long did you spend? I lived for a year in the One year? Yeah. Uh, only one year? Okay. What about any, any other person? <coughs> did, did you land for traveling? <coughs> traveling? No? Okay. But what's your um, 
when New Zealand, when you think of New Zealand, what kind of image comes to you, my, your mind first? <coughs> what kind of image comes to you, come to your mind first <coughs> when you think about New Zealand? <coughs> Environmental friendly? Yeah, like nature, environmental, or environment friendly atmosphere of the country. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then? Ships. Ships. <laughs> okay. Lord of the Rings. Huh? Lord of the Rings. Yeah, Lord of the Rings. And? <laughs> Chiwan? Nature. Nature? Full of nature? No cities? Only ships and <laughs> in flow of nature. Oh, yeah? Hunting gathering society. Tamaris? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I just think of a very pretty nature like place but that's all I really know of. Uh huh. I, in, in Korea, when New Zealand is advertised, it is advertised as very clean. You know, very clean country. But this research does not tell you that New Zealand is a clean country. But I mean, everything is in a relative sense, right? Maybe compared to Seoul, most of uh, New Zealand places probably are cleaner, the air quality, in terms of air quality and uh, water quality and so on and so on. But then, this research shows you uh, the spatial inequalities, so whether you live in south or north. Uh, Korea is divided north and south, but New Zealand is also divided north and south in terms of health issue, in terms of environmental health issue and human health mm -hmm. issue. So I, show you I, I will show you this map. So it's a South Island and North Island, right? South Island, and Christ Church is here, right? It's a South Island and North Island. Where is the capital city of New Zealand? Huh? Wellington? Wellington? Mm -hmm. I hope so. Okay. <coughs> So Wellington is in the uh, in the south of North Island and is uh, near to uh, South Island. So in terms of in terms of environmental health, in terms of environmental condition, New Zealand's divide between North and South. The reason I mentioned this, according to the the research, the if you. Uh, If you visit the, the article at the end of textbook, after the, the article we read last week, the risk communication among Chinese students, the third article is the environmental justice and health, a study of multiple environmental deprivation and geographical inequality inequalities in health in New Zealand. But uh, I just asked, ask you to remember this uh, map, this distribu distribution. So if you do environmental justice research, if, if you can show this kind of uh, spatial distribution map, that's very effective. That's very effective. Like uh, with the example of Ro Robert Blood, he showed the uh, spatial, spatial, right? You know, space, uh, space. Spatial. So where you live in New Zealand, but not only in New Zealand, all of the world, where you live in, that affects you, that affects you, your health, how long you can live. So uh, the researcher of that article studied 
Mortality. What does that mean, mortality? <coughs> mortality is a death rate, right? Death. So in French, mort, la mort, M-O-R-T, that means death. Yeah. M-O in French, la mort, M-O-R-T. So mortality means a death rate. So how long, you sp how long you can survive, how long you can live? It all depends upon where you live. So according to res this research, uh, which space, which area, which people, who, which, is, uh, which space, which areas uh, do, do have more, uh, more lives? Uh, less mortality, so longer, uh, longer lifespans. So I explained this uh, map. The first is uh, New Zealand medics score indicates uh, the darkest. That means most environmentally deprived areas. So uh, dirty air uh, and cold temperature. and uh, less green space and a lot of industrial facilities and air pollution and not enough uh, sunshine. So sunshine in terms of ultraviolet has two phases. One is if you receive too much, it's a danger for skin cancer. But if you do not have uh, received that much uh, sunshine, that means lack of vitamin D. And, and vitamin D is uh, good for your health. So taking sun is a double phase. One is uh, taking too much is, uh, skin cancer. And New Zealand and Australia, skin cancer is a big issue. Right? Uh, skin <coughs> cancer is a big issue. So. They studied each areas in New Zealand in terms of exposure to air pollution and whether these areas are cold or hot, uh, cold and warm. Hot water, uh, sorry, hot temperature is also not good, right? I'm already worrying about the summer <laughs> because summer in Korea now is a very, it's a quite difficult to resist. <coughs> I'm already worrying about that, you know. So warm, warm temperatures is good, like today, you know, about the temperature between uh, 18 and 25, but over 30 is too, sometimes 30 for too much, too much, you know. So warm, warm climate is good. <coughs> and industrial facilities, so if you have uh, more industrial facilities, you, it's a more environmentally <coughs> deprived. But if you have a more green sp space, that means you have uh, less environmentally deprived. And UV uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation uh, rate. You do not have to remember everything sophisticated in this article, but I just invite you to remember uh, this map, for me, it's a very important information, and I hope that also uh, comes to you. <coughs> because New Zealand is different to country between <coughs> South and North Island. Because in terms of environmental condition, which we saw the five, uh, the five thing that exposure to air pollution, cold climate, industry facilities, and green space, and UV radiation. Uh, New Zealand is a different uh, country between south and north. Uh, that means the dark, the darkest, the darkest, where is the darkest? South and north. The darkest, right? They are the they are the 
uh, places in New Zealand, environmentally deprived uh, areas. Just one word, those are the places not good for living. So not enough green space, and possibly a lot more industrial facilities, and climate is not good, and more possibility to expose uh, air pollution. Sonyoung, do you know where it is? probably picked because it's the closest city to Antarctica, probably. You? No, like, I mean, like, since New Zealand is the country that is closest to Antarctica, it's heavily influenced by its cold climate, and since that city over there is, like, the closest. Ah, uh, but you don't know the name of this area, no? Mm. Okay, Sonyang mentioned that this area close to Antarctica and probably it's a very cold, cold climate. But, but this uh, map, this map is accumulated, it's uh, produced, we're considering five things. One is uh, exposure to air pollution. The second is, what is the second one? Cold climate, whether the area is cold or warm. So warm temperature is uh, environmentally good or not? Compared to cold climate, yeah, I think a warm climate is an uh, environmentally good condition. <coughs> I think so. Yeah. And third? Industrial, uh, industrial facilities. So if there are uh, complex of industrial facilities. If there are a lot of industrial facilities, that means environmentally deprived, not environmentally benign. And fourth, green sorry, green space. If you have a more green space, you feel much better. If you have more gray space, like a cement, you feel not good. You feel also gray. Gray space and green space. And, and, yeah, ultraviolet. It, it means that h how much you can receive the sun. <coughs> so these, these one, two, four, five. Okay, one, two, three, four, four. These four areas are the uh, most environmentally deprived in New Zealand. So remember these four areas. Okay? Remember these four areas. But this uh, playlist, this playlist is great. This playlist indicates most environmentally benign, most environmentally uh, best area. So in those five indicators, this playlist are the environmentally good, environmentally good areas. So where is it? Many places in north, north, right? Ah. Where is it? The north, right? North. North top, top north. Here. Here is the environmentally best condition in New Zealand. So the reason I say New Zealand <coughs> is a country divided between north and south in terms of environmental condition and also in between, in between the negative, uh, uh, sorry, environmental deprived areas are more, more uh, located in south compared to north. So the colors pale indicate better environmental condition, and the dark, the dark color indicate indicates the 
not good environmental condition. Okay? So if you have money in New Zealand, where do you live? And so I can give you a probably the 100% per correct answer. Probably rich people in New Zealand, they have probably have a house in here. They work in Wellington. They, they probably have a holiday house. So North Island is much more uh, environmentally good conditioned. So we can ask the question, environmental justice issue, whether people in North and South to live longer or not? To live longer or not? Can you read this, uh, this uh, map? Do you understand what I'm saying? So next time you visit uh, New Zealand, visit here and also visit here. And you see the great contrast. You see the great contrast between North and South uh, for New Zealand. You can observe with your naked eyes. What does that mean? Being environmentally good area and living in environmentally good area and living in environmentally deprived area, what does that mean for your everyday life and for your uh, lifespan and for your uh, life chances and wealth and health and honor? What does that mean? So environmental justice research uh, normally include this kind of so spatial, spatial data. <coughs> and this is empirical data, empirical. Empirical means you collect the data uh, that are already published for the situation of society. for the situation of society. So they collect data about exposure to air pollution and green space, the, the size of green space, and so on, so on. So this map shows us a um, contrast situation in New Zealand. People live in north they have a more, they are more likely to enjoy uh, better environmental condition uh, compared to people, those living in uh, South. What about Maori? <laughs> Maori people, where do they live? Sonyang? Everywhere. Everywhere? Ah, yeah? Okay. What about in Australia? They don't live uh, everywhere, they live in some uh, territory, like, you know? Northern Territory. Northern Territory? Yeah, they live in certain places together, right? Not everywhere. Who does? Huh? Who does? Maori? No, no, Aboriginal. Oh. Um, like, they sort of, they sort of live everywhere in Australia, mm. but they mainly congregate, like, together mm. in some places. Mainly in, like, the lower economic areas, sort of, like, maybe up. West or the Northern Territory, sort of thing. Okay. Northern Territory is for, for Aboriginal people living, no? Northern Territory. Oh, I mean, everyone can live there, but there is a lot more Aboriginals in the Northern Territory than everywhere else. Sure, sure. Okay. So, and, and this is a shows that uh, whether you live in South Island and North Island, whether they, uh, it's uh, related to your mortality, so you live longer or you live shorter. <coughs> so those areas which are environmentally deprived, uh, which means the South Island, 
especially in south, the so, uh, southernmost part. So mainly in South Island, they are more likely to suffer higher mortality level. So that means if you want to live longer in New Zealand, you better to live in North Island, not South Island. Okay? And those areas where environment is benign, so North Island, are more likely to suffer less mortality. So that means uh, natural environment, that means natural environment, the environment condition affects human life, even, even uh, our health. So whether you can live longer or shorter, the environmental condition affects you. And that's the wonderful reason that we have to take care of <coughs> the uh, natural environment not to be degraded, because that also affects your health. And there's uh, another uh, thing uh, that the researcher has found it out is um, the communities of minority communities, whether it's racially, ethnically. So race and ethnicity is a different concept. Race is a biological concept. It's uh, defined by your, uh, your color, your face color and it's a biological concept, but ethnicity is a cultural concept. What language do you speak and what uh, religions do you uh, believe? That's ethnicity, right? So in New Zealand, uh, ethnic minorities, they are likely to have more uh, hazardous waste sites like, uh, like the United States. And they, they, they're more likely to near to industry facilities sewage treatment plants <coughs> and other locally undesirable facilities. Those uh, minority groups in New Zealand, racial, racially or ethnically, they are more likely to live uh, near to these uh, environmentally unwanted uh, facilities. And they are more likely to be exposed to uh, pollutants so that they experience uh, respiratory, the breathing problems. They have a, a long, long problems. So they cannot uh, breathe properly. You, if you are interested in environmental justice research in South Korea, there are many, many topics to research. And among them, you can research like uh, the people who have uh, the breathing problems with the event of um, PM, what is it called? The particular met the Visemonji finest, finest. With the finders, when, the f when finders uh, to take place very seriously, whether does that affect uh, people who have uh, the breathing problems? We have a long, long problems and respiratory problems. You can you can uh, study that issue. <coughs> and there is some there are some other uh, the my, uh, ethnically and minor <coughs> the racially minority groups they are exposed to. Uh, other pollutants, for example, they're more likely to live near a uh, busy roads, so it's a uh, noisy pollution. Their everyday life suffer the noisy pollution. What about in Seoul? If you live where in Seoul, it's likely to suffer uh, most uh, busy roads pollution. I'm sorry, the the noise pollution from busy roads. Wanshik? Which, which area do you consider um, loudest residence, uh, residence areas in Seoul? Uh, maybe places like Mo and Kungcheon. Ah, Kuro. A lot of uh, uh, bus traffic, bus and cars and traffic. 
Oh yeah? Okay. So noise pollution. So too many traffic, you know, in, fr uh, in front of your uh, residence places. There are probably big uh, road and cars and going and coming in very, fr very frequently and, you know. And also the metro or train train station, you to train stations. When the train, uh, but not on the ground, the outside. <coughs> and indoor pollutants, like uh, from painting, they all have uh, some chemical compounds, right? And these also pollutants are found in poor and African American Hispanic in households. So minorities in every country, they are likely to suffer environmental bads, environmentally uh, not good uh, condition. And now I introduce another issue, environment inequality in China in China. China changing so fast and that means uh, China change f the, the natural environment in China also changes so fast but, but negatively so we, we can imagine how you know, the natural environment in China cha would change and I would mention one, uh, one thing in Jiangsu province there's a work Jiangsu province located East Coast, so near to Shanghai, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a study uh, under, undertaken in 2012 by Shul Shulman and Ma, and they pro uh, they presented their research output. And for China, there is also uh, environmental justice issue with the case of Jiangsu Province. Jiangsu province uh, recently uh, hosting a lot of uh, industrial facilities, industrial uh, com the factories. But then if you consider with the environmental justice issue, I want to mention this. In China, there's a Hukou uh, registry system. So if you are born in urban and if you are born rural, you have to live there until you die. It's difficult to uh, people who are born in uh, a, a rural area to, to shift their residence in, uh, in urban and they, they it's, uh, in settle down. That it is difficult, particularly for Beijing, it's forbidden by law. <coughs> but then now, uh, particularly East Coast, East Coast uh, cities, province in China, they, uh, they, ho they are hosting uh, industrial facilities uh, factory, so which means people who, who are born in uh, rural and who have lived in rural, they move to an uh, urban area to find a job, to want to uh, yeah, to want to a uh, uh, factory, to want to as a factory worker. But the problem is, uh, uh, due to the uh, hukou registry system, those people who are born in rural and who have to li uh, lived in rural. <laughs> They found their place um, in ob uh, difficult in urban area, and they just end up being illegal residents in urban areas, and that means they ended up settled down in environmentally very uh, deprived communities. So urban workers in China, with people who are born in rural they are the most vulnerable to, to deteriorate to the uh, environmental quality in Jiangsu province. That's the, their, um, their conclusion. And they, they explained why it happened because of the Chinese own unique registration system. It's a population controlling system uh, of whether you are born in rural or urban. So people who are uh, born in rural, they want to find a job in urban area as a factory worker, but then it's somehow illegal 
it's it's uh, it's a difficult to uh, to move in urban and settle down in urban. So they somehow uh, you know, ended up living in uh, environmentally very uh, deprived communities as an as an illegal illegal resident. So that they uh, so that they become uh, environmental victims, environmental victims, uh, ending up ending up settled down in environmentally deprived the communities. And for Jiangsu province, they showed a very strong uh, indication. So if you look at the, this map, so if you, want, if you are interested in environmental justice research, you bring up this kind of map, right? So if you want to uh, environmental justice research <coughs> for Seoul, you study the like a school kids, or, or adult population who have a long the respiratory system, uh, uh, respiratory problems, where where they are in Seoul, whether they are disproportionately like a Kumcheonggu or uh, Kurogu, some less well um, wealthy uh, regions in Seoul. So you can have uh, you can. Uh, Argues with the the uh, those uh, the pro disproportionate proportion of long problems, uh, populations linking with uh, some noisy you know air, uh, noise uh, pollution or air pollution and so on. So this dot uh, the black dot indicates pollution, and some areas are more pollution and some areas are less pollution. So some places are uh, 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 white, some places are uh, becoming dark. And you <coughs> if you see south and urban north, that's urban townships. And they found out that uh, in urban townships, particularly with uh, environmentally deprived communities, they find uh, rural workers. So those people who are born in rural and moved to Jiangsu province um, to find a job, they are more, they are most suffer the, their uh, health problems. Okay. Now I have to talk uh, climate justice, but today time just moving so fast. Okay, climate justice is uh, proposed from the 1990s. Climate change is itself as the political and social agenda since the, 1990, since the 1990s. And if you say climate justice, doing justice with the climate change, what does that mean? So these three questions indicate doing a justice with the climate change. The first one is uh, who caused the climate change? So it's a responsibility question. Who caused uh, climate change? And distribution of impact. So uh, cl the Im impact of climate change. Who who has been who has been given? Who has been who has received more? So who will suffer most because of it? And the third is uh, who will pay <coughs> to fix it? Who will pay to fix it? So if you can uh, answer the question one. The probably those who cause the problem has to pay more, right? So these are the three questions for uh, climate change. So climate change impacts are uh, uh, numerous. First is a higher temperature, and it's a heat-related disease and illness. And not only that, it's somehow changed to the climate patterns. So there used to be the climate patterns. For example, Korea has four very di different seasons. But now the four seasons are somehow disappearing. <laughs> somehow two seasons, like, you know, hot and not hot, cold, hot and cold. So shorter spring and shorter, uh, shorter water. So new pattern, new climb, new climb patterns. That means new patterns of raining, 
and if uh, and more evaporation, so the climate is uh, increasing, more evaporation, and that means and also hot uh, climate means more fire, and warmer ocean means more hurricane. So <coughs> hurricane and fire it comes with the, the the temperature goes up. So if climate change, there's a new pattern coming up. And also for the wildlife, there's a new pattern in habitat of ecosystems, new migration patterns, you know, <coughs> different patterns of interactions among uh, members in, in natural world. So new patterns with the climate change, there will be new patterns of climate. So it's just about new risk, right? Which you have, have never experienced before and which we have not much uh, knowledge because we did not experience before. And it, it is a new pattern, so it's very difficult to predict. And the another important issue is uh, for people's livelihood activities, those people who live upon natural resources, like uh, farmers and fishers, rent the, those people raising animals, like uh, horses, uh, cows, they are affected. They are affected with the climate change. Why? Compared to uh, the factory workers, those who work in a factory, the livelihood activities workers, they are more affected because they are very, they are very work based upon nature. So agriculture and fishing and hunting, cattle ranching, they are all affected by new patterns of climate. And decrease in yields, shorter growing season. So if uh, shorter spring and shorter uh, autumn, then that means use for, uh, for doing agricultural activities. That means it's shorter growing season, right? And sea level rise, it's also, uh, it's also uh, important, a dangerous risk. So those, commi those communities that are formed along the coastline, they should be equipped with well, uh, well-planned risk uh, management uh, you know, the plans. Because it's the possibility, it's a possible risk that can happen to coastal communities. Like Australia, <laughs> many people living <coughs> along the east side, you know, east south and coast, uh, the, along the coastline, you know. Mm -hmm. And the cities also, uh, made along the east coast. Major population they live along. So that all indicates vulnerability and these areas like a small island who live upon, who doesn't have any industry except that nature-based industry. And small islands like a small economy they're very vulnerable. And near the equator, those countries near to the equator, now it's already hot, but if it becomes hotter, the, the body system who used to the adapted the, the temperature, they probably uh, suffer. And new types of disease with the temperature change new types of disease. So normally the young people, kids, and all the people, they are the uh, vulnerable groups when these um, different patterns of climate take place. So compared to the global north, like, like a com compared to global north, those countries located the above the equator, like uh, North America, uh, Western Europe, compared to the Africa and South America and Asia, 
the global north in sociology is considered a rich country or the economically developed country or powerful country or it's a service-based economy or manufactured-based economy. But then global south is less rich <coughs> and natural resources dependent uh, societies. So their economy is very dependent on natural resources, whether it's a fish, whether it's a agricultural, whether it's a crops. If there are new patterns, new patterns of climate emerging, their uh, economy and their everyday, their livelihood activities are very much likely to be affected negatively. So, so doing environment, doing climate justice, that means uh, to help those people in living in global south, because with the three questions, who caused climate change, and the negative uh, impact of distribution of negative impacts that were given to the people in global south, and who have to pay for it. And Global North, North is considered to pay for uh, climate change because Global North is considered, uh, uh, considered causing the climate change. Why is that? Why Global North, the countries in Global North are considered to cause climate change? One sheet. <coughs> Right, right. Because they are the very first countries, among the very first countries, which began industrialization far earlier than countries in Global South, right? Those countries in located in Global North, they began industrialization uh, far earlier, far ahead of countries in Global South. Like for example, the one I showed the map, the picture for Seoul today, like for Korea, how long we have experienced the global uh, sorry, industrialization? That means our economy, <coughs> South Korea's economy, based upon agriculture, transforming to uh, uh, manufacturing. So you produce products in a factory, not in an agricultural field. How long we have experienced that? About 50, that long. Okay, if you consider from the 60s, yeah, about 50. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. But what about United States? <coughs> when did you, and did the United States begin industrialization? Nineteen hundred, yeah. So a lot longer than uh, South Korea, right? Mm -hmm. In in like England, Western Europe, uh, they they did they did industrialization <coughs> much ahead of the countries in Global South, and still many countries in Global South they don't have any uh, industrial bases and just uh, live upon natural resources. And if the new pattern emerging to uh, climate, the problem, many problem, um, co complicated. Okay. Uh, let me conclude for the topic today. So the topic for today is the how uh, environmental change impact upon different social groups. That's the key topic <coughs> for today. <coughs> And uh, environmental justice research scholars, they, they consider, they believe that environmental change disproportionately affect a uh, different group of people in a society. <coughs> so it is, in, in, in terms of environmental justice, it is not fair. It is, uh, it is an unfair game. So it begins in the United States 
And the concept of environmental studies hi highlights environmental inequality caused by race and social class and so on. And, and I show you, the, show you the, the issue in New Zealand, United States, and China. And you can also study uh, co for Korea, but for Korea, race is not an uh, important concept to explain a South Korean social structure, right? Why is that? Race, we, it doesn't matter. We don't have any uh, other the racial groups. Even if we have, it's a very <coughs> tiny. It's mostly, um, in terms of race, we, it's, it's mostly Mongoloid, you know, Asian group. We don't have that much blacks, and we don't have that much whites, you know. But compared to United States and New Zealand, some, the countries that are uh, formed based upon immigration, they, f for that country's race is a very important um, important factor to explain their society, but for Korea, race is a, it's not a concept to explain. But uh, social class is a uh, very important um, factor. So you can also do environmental justice research, research for uh, South Korea. And climate justice concept is a highlight vulnerability of the global South, global South. So people dependent upon uh, natural resources use for their economy, for their uh, livelihoods, uh, probably affected, probably negatively affected <laughs> significantly by new patterns of climate. Okay? So uh, that's all for the topic for today. And then next week we'll have a midterm exam. So I, as I announced uh, several times, uh, the, the midterm exam cover from the second week, what is environmental sociology up to, up to today, up to environmental justice. So I give you four essay questions and you write down in detail as much as you want. And one, so you pick up three questions, not four, right? Sometimes, you know, <laughs> sometimes some students, they, they write all of the four, but if you do, I, I, it gives me difficulty which one to, to choose. So you, you choose three questions, and one question uh, is given <coughs> 10 scores, okay? 10 scores. So the exam time is from 11 to 1, two hours. Our class begins at 10.30, but the midterm exam begins from 11, 11 o'clock. <coughs> so 11 o'clock up to 1 p.m. for two hours. Okay, I'll, I'll collect uh, some questions about uh, midterm exam. If you have any. Mm -hmm. How long does each answer have to be? How long? <laughs> it doesn't matter. You, you can write down as much as you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of what the questions would be like? Sorry? Can you give us like an example of what the questions would be like? No, no. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Writing in pen or pencil doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. And for Korean students, if you are not uh, confident in writing English, you can try writing in Korean. But uh, as I mentioned several times, I give more more scores to those uh, answers in English. But uh, rather than leaving many things in spaces in just blank spaces, <coughs> it probably also an alternative um, thing to write in Korean. But then you try your best writing in, in Korean. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other questions? <coughs> no? Okay, so that's all for today, and I'll see you sometime. <laughs> <laughs>